Hello everyone and welcome to the second in a series of biology review videos. These are meant to help students review essential content for the end of course SOL biology test done in Virginia, but they can be used as a refresher on a lot of basic biology topics for exam review. If you're coming from another state as you follow along, I encourage you to use the resources linked in the video description and go ahead and subscribe if you find this kind of material useful for biology science exam review. In this video we're going to be focusing specifically on the bio.4 and bio.5 standards. Let's get started. So remember, viruses are not living organisms. They are small infectious particles, usually surrounded by a protein coat. They have nucleic acid, so either RNA or DNA inside them, but they can be very different. You might recognize this one as the shape of the coronavirus. So you might have seen a very similar drawing uh, in the media recently. This is a T4 phage. So this is a type of virus that infects bacteria, not people. And this is a virus, the tobacco mosaic virus, that infects plants, not people either. Through studying viruses, scientists have developed vaccines and antiviral medication that helps us fight viruses. Remember, vaccines are dead or weakened forms of a virus that are injected into a person so, so that the body is able to produce antibodies and have a stronger response when they're actually infected by the real virus. Remember, they're not cells, they're extremely tiny, and we have to use a, even a special type of microscope to see them. Remember, some viruses help us. They're not all bad guys, like this T4 phage can help us fight off bacteria. Some can even attack bacteria that infect the roots of your teeth. And of course, we have a lot of history of viruses there's some viral DNA left in our genome as well. In order to replicate, viruses need a host. They can't do it on their own. So this is a really simple diagram of how a virus might replicate. This is a phage, again, or bacterial phage. And it'll either send its DNA or RNA into the host cell or enter the host cell itself. And then we're going to have assimilation where the viral DNA is going to take over the host and basically gets the host cell to copy its nucleic acids and build viral proteins. And then there's assembly where these, these new viral particles are assembled and eventually they will exit the cell. They'll release and burst out of the cell most of the time, killing it. To contrast, bacteria are living organisms. They can also be pathogens, so they can also cause disease. This is kind of a traditional diagram of a bacterial cell. Remember, some bacteria can have cell walls. They all have a cell membrane. All cells have a cell membrane. This is their DNA in the center. It does not have a nucleus. They are prokaryotic organisms. Some viruses have cilia or flagella attached for movement and then ribosomes as well, but they don't have membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria. We can grow bacterial colonies on things like petri dishes here, so this bacteria has been genetically modified to glow, or at least the diagram of it has. Now, bacteria play really important roles uh, in the ecosystems. Yes, they can cause diseases, but they also are really important in cycling of nutrients. So, for example, this is the nitrogen cycle, and there's all these different types of bacteria, like nitrogen-fixing bacteria, or nitrifying bacteria, or denitrifying bacteria that are going to play different roles and transferring the nitrogen that exists in the atmosphere so that it can be accessible uh, to other living things like plants and animals. Now, bacteria can reproduce on their own. They are living things, so they have that characteristic. Some bacteria reproduce through binary fission, which is a little bit like mitosis, but, but basically it's going to copy its contents and then divide into two identical daughter cells. And then in conjugation, this is a little bit more rare, but we can have a bacterial cell have a special structure that will inject a portion of its DNA. So this is a plasmid or a circular piece of its DNA and send it to another bacterial cell. This, is, this could be like an advantageous trait, like antibiotic resistance, and then the new bacteria who receives the new uh, plasmid can incorporate that into its own genome and express those traits. So this is a type of sexual reproduction in bacteria, and this here is a type of asexual reproduction. Now bacteria can get their food or their energy in a variety of ways. Some are heterotrophic, meaning they get their food by consuming others. Some are photoautotrophs, meaning they get their food by uh, absorbing sunlight energy and then converting that into into organic molecules, and then some are chemoautotrophs where they do not have access to sunlight and they may get their energy from a variety of chemicals. These deep sea worms often feed off of chemoautotrophic bacteria, so we can't see the bacteria here, but they can provide the foundation for a deep aquatic food web. Now, now we understand because of the work of many scientists that pathogens like bacteria and viruses and fungi can cause diseases even if we can't see them. And French chemist Louis Pasteur did a lot of work with this. Um, we might know him for pasteurization method, but he also did experiments that showed that food spoiled because they were contaminated by bacteria that we couldn't see, not because they just spontaneously went bad or they spontaneously 
because of his experiments and the work of others, we were able to understand that bacteria can cause infection and disease in people. And so now we know to avoid illness or to avoid diseases caused by bacteria and other pathogens that we can do things like handling food and water safely, washing our hands with soap and warm water. We recognized during the COVID-19 pandemic that we needed to wear masks in order to prevent the spread of viral particles. But we also have things like vaccines, which scientists develop. Now, there is a difference between a vaccine and an antibiotic. Remember, vaccines are there to prevent diseases. Um, we get a dead or weakened form of a virus and the body's immune system learns how to fight it off in the future. Antibiotics are after you have already encountered a bacterial illness. And if, as long as they're used responsibly, possibly in the quick, correct way prescribed by a doctor, they can kill off the bacteria in the body, often though there are problems with the overuse of antibiotics, so we have to be very careful with those. All right, so let's move forward into inheritance. Now, a lot of this topic touches on DNA, and remember I did introduce DNA in the previous video, so please go back and check out part one if you want a little bit more information on the structure of nucleotides and protein synthesis. The structure of DNA is very specific. It is made of nucleotides, and scientists use different models to represent and understand DNA. For example, this is the double helix or twisted ladder model, um, but often sometimes you may see DNA represented like this in order to see the bases. So our bases here, A, T, G, and C, and we can see how they have hydrogen bonds that are connected in the middle here. And the backbone is made of phosphate and sugar molecules. Now remember, DNA carries information. Those letters are gonna be the genetic code, and those instructions are gonna be passed through mRNA and then translated in a, into a particular order of amino acids, which then fold into a protein. So DNA holds the code for, or the instructions for all of the proteins in the body. And this is pretty much universal for all living things. We all contain the same type of genetic code that can be converted into different orders of amino acids. In the previous video, I talked about how to use a codon chart or an amino acid chart, but do remember that DNA holds the code to build proteins. Now, DNA is found in the nucleus of a cell and the DNA is usually in chromatin form, meaning it's unwound or decondensed, but when a cell is preparing for cell division, it'll condense into these chromosomes. So if we look here, we kind of see the organization of DNA. Our DNA again is wound into a double helix and it's very, very long. We have over 20,000 genes in the body and this long strain of DNA is wound around special proteins and then that is all condensed up into a single chromosome. But each section of DNA that codes for a specific trait or provides instructions for a particular protein is called a gene. Now, not every single part of our DNA codes for a protein. Some parts of our DNA are there to regulate what parts of the DNA are turned on or off. Some we don't know what they do and some again may be relics of viruses from the past. Sometimes chromosomes are represented like this with each band or segment representing a particular gene or set of genes and we've learned all of this through different technologies uh, like DNA sequencing and we can determine the order of A's, T's, C's, and G's in a piece of DNA and we've made big advances in this technique. We can do now next gen sequencing which is a lot faster now but still sequencing an entire genome is kind of tough. We did have breakthroughs with the Human Genome Project where we sequenced all of the genes within, within the human body. And now we have plenty of advances in DNA technology. Things like genetic engineering can be applied in agriculture, in medicine, in industry, and in just general research projects to use DNA and insert it into different organisms in order to express traits that might be helpful. So for example, this corn has a specific gene that's been inserted into it that is able to resist a corn rootworm, which it is very vulnerable to. A lot of these things are possible through different biotechnology techniques. So PCR, polymerase chain reaction is one of those, gel electrophoresis is another, we already mentioned DNA sequencing, and then of course, bacterial transformation. Just very briefly, polymerase chain reaction or PCR is a way to make a lot of copies of DNA in a very short period of time. So DNA is denatured or separated by heating it up. And then when it's cooled a little bit, we have these special small segments called primers that can anneal or attach to the DNA. New nucleotides are added to make new strands based on that template. And then we do it again. So we separate the molecule and then we add the primers. And then this is all done within a machine over and over and over again until we get many copies in a short period of time, which allows us to do all of these experiments with DNA. Now, in order to chop DNA up and use things like a gel electrophoresis or a DNA fingerprint, we can use specific enzymes that will cut DNA at a particular site with a 
very particular base pair pattern. And so these restriction enzymes shown here as like scissors will separate the DNA. And then once it's cut, we can feed it through something like a gel, which can analyze uh, different fragments of DNA based on their length. And so we can load in our DNA at the top or the wells. And then from there, we can look at the DNA as it goes down. And at the bottom, we have a positive charge. And because DNA is negatively charged itself, it'll run down the gel and be attracted towards the positive end. So we'll add the DNA up here and it'll go down the gel. And then we can compare different samples of DNA and to see how their different fragments match. So for example, at a crime scene, if we have a particular piece of evidence, we can see after we've cut them with these restriction enzymes, if it matches up with a particular suspect's DNA. So in this case, the evidence best matches with suspect three. Now, bacterial transformation might've been something that you've seen in your class, but we can get organisms to express new traits by adding DNA to them. So here we have the plasmid with the new DNA inserted into the bacterial cell. And there's of course laboratory techniques that allow this DNA to be taken up by the bacterial cell. And then the bacterial cell will hopefully copy itself with that new DNA and express the new trait. So we can make, for example, bacteria glow green. So of course, bacteria copy themselves, but let's take a quick look at how this happens in humans and how our genes can be passed on to our offspring. Species have to be able to reproduce in order to pass on their traits and their genes and to survive. Some organisms reproduce asexually and virtually all of their genes come from the same parent and so they're copies of the parent organism. Other organisms reproduce sexually and have half of the genetic information come from two different parents. So one half comes from one parent and one half of the genetic information comes from another parent. And those two haploid cells are combined. You might've heard of cloning before. And that's the idea that we make an identical genetic copy of one organism. Dolly the sheep was a famous clone. Remember, in order to get those haploid cells or gametes or sex cells for sexual reproduction, we have to go through meiosis first. The process of meiosis results in half the genetic information in the daughter cells and in humans, this happens during the production of eggs or sperm. We can get lots of genetic variation through meiosis, through independent assortment of chromosomes, crossing over of chromosomes during prophase one of meiosis, and then of course the random fertilization of one egg cell with any one sperm cell. Remember, mutation is an important source of genetic variation, but these three reasons on this slide are very, very important as well. Process of meiosis imp is important in sexual reproduction because it provides genetic variation of offspring, and genetic diversity is important for the survival of a species. So in order to get the, that egg and that sperm, we have to go through the process of meiosis first. Then those two can undergo fertilization to produce a zygote, which is a fertilized egg cell and now a diploid cell. So let's put this all together. In humans, both a biological male and a biological female will need to undergo meiosis in order to produce eggs and sperm. Then one egg cell and one sperm cell will combine in fertilization. After that, that fertilized egg will divide and make copies of itself through mitosis as the embryo starts to grow. Mitosis will continue, continue until the cells start to differentiate and become all the different important parts of the growing embryo. Many of our core principles of genetics are attributed to Gregor Mendel. He came up with Mendelian principles of inheritance and he used a lot of data from a lot of different pea plants. So some basic review for Mendelian inheritance. This is our classical dominant recessive type of inheritance. Remember that genes are often represented by letters and different versions of genes could be capital or lowercase case let letters. So here we see the trait for this axolotl. Um, the color of their skin is either going to be pigmented, so this dark color, or uh, without pigment, so this albino axolotl. And to represent these different versions of these traits, we have uh, letters that are going to be different alleles. So the pigment allele will be a big A and the albino allele will be a little a. Now each organism has a genotype. These organisms have two genes for a particular trait. So this albino axolotl is homozygous recessive, meaning it has two little a's. So little a, little a would be this axolotl's genotype, but it's Phenotype, its physical characteristic for the trait is albino. That's the color. So remember, phenotype, physical characteristic. Genotype is the actual combination of alleles or genes. Now, this pigmented axolotl could be one of two genotypes. It could either be big A, big A, homozygous dominant, or it could be big A, little a, because this big A is dominant over the recessive allele, and it's going to mask or cover up the effects of this recessive gene. So when we see a pigmented axolotl, it could be either one of these genotypes, but both of these genotypes will give us the pigmented phenotype. All right, so let's take a look at a practice 
practice problem involving these and our tool, the Punnett square. So let's say we have two pigmented axolotls that are both heterozygous, meaning they have one big A and one little a, and they are going to mate. We can use things like a Punnett square to see what the chances are of their offspring either being albino or having pigment. So in this case, to set up a Punnett square, we would take one parent and put it on the top of the Punnett square, separating out their alleles or their letters. We would take the other parent and separate that out their alleles or letters as well. And then what we do is we drop down all our letters and we fill in the Punnett square. So this big A gets dropped down here and here. This little A gets dropped down here and here. And this big A gets dragged over here and this little A gets dragged over here. So now we have the results of our Punnett square. We can see that there's a 25% chance of having offspring that will have a homozygous dominant genotype, meaning big A, big A, a 50% chance of having offspring that will have the heterozygous genotype, so big A, little a, and a 25% chance or one in four chance of having little a, little a, or homozygous recessive. Now, that's a lot of words. What does that mean? So these three combinations here, big A, big A, or big A, little A, big A, little A, that would all mean this axolotl has pigment or is a dark color because A is dominant over little A. So we have two copies here. It doesn't really matter. Here we have one copy of the dominant trait. So it's going to be dominant over the albino trait. An axolotl with little A, little A though, that genotype means it doesn't have any pigment because it has two copies of the recessive allele. So if you need more practice on Punnett squares, it might come up on the test. I have some other resources on this channel you can check out or you can go back to your class materials. Now this is just one type of inheritance. Genes and traits can get a little bit more complicated than that. There's other types of inheritance. We have incomplete dominance where instead of having one gene being dominant over the other we see a blending. So this would be a flower with, with both a red and a white allele. So we see a combination of those. We see the pink trait. Sometimes we see co-dominance where we see both traits being expressed in a particular organism. So this flower has both pink petals and partially white petals that means both of those traits are expressed and so that's a difference from the blend where we see the combination here and sometimes we can have more than two alleles or two forms of a particular trait so blood groups is an example of this so you can be a blood type you can be o blood type you can be b blood type so you could have any one of those alleles for one of your genes for blood type. So that is just a basic overview of some key topics for Bio 4 and Bio 5 for the Virginia Biology SOL. Please stay tuned for part three. We're gonna continue on to review this content. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.